Hello, everybody. Welcome into the NBA front office show. Happy Monday. Oh, my goodness. The glorious chaos that the draft lottery brought to us. We've got a ton to talk about there. We've already got draft pick trade rumors to get into. All kinds of stuff going on in the world of uh, the NBA. Oh, yeah, there's a little thing called the playoffs happening, too. You know, I suppose <laughs> I suppose we should talk about that as well. I'm Trevor Lane, joined by Keith Smith. Keith, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, the uh, lottery was, as you termed it perfectly, chaos. It was, it was just madness that went on with the lottery. We're going to get into all of that. Uh, even in a draft where people are like, yeah, this draft kind of stinks. Like, like yeah. It's still fun, right, that there was uh, this much going on there. And, and it's funny, though, I am seeing – a lot of so people who cover the draft, it's kind of what they do full time. And some other folks, they're starting to come around a little bit on this draft class. Just a just a little around the idea of like, hey, there's going to be some guys. And the common comparison is 2013, which was the Anthony Bennett mm. draft, which everybody's like, yeah, that thing Ooh. was a mess. <laughs> but important to remember, Giannis and Rudy Gobert came out of that draft. So... Somebody will emerge. There will be all stars who come out of this draft class at some point, even if right now they're a lot harder to peg. In, in other words, maybe not the best draft to have the first pick in. Then <laughs> um, we'll talk about that <laughs> with Atlanta. But uh, I, I think the best way, the, the way that I'm starting to look at this draft is because people are so down on it in general. I think you can be down on this draft if you're looking for the guy. If you're looking for the guy, you're probably not going to find him in this draft, but you can find a guy. You can find a guy in this draft that can definitely help your team. Finding the guy that you're going to build your team around, probably unlikely to happen. I mean, we never know. I mean, sure. Nikola Jokic was a second round pick. You never know, right? But you, there's a better chance that you're going to find a guy in this draft, which, I mean, it brings me to this. So the Atlanta Hawks, they beat the odds. 3% chance of getting the number one overall pick. And what do you know? They get it. They get the number one pick. I've seen some people saying, of course, and the Hawks fans saying, of course, this is the year we move all the way. Not that they're mad they moved up because it's a good thing, right? But of course, the year there's no Wemby at the top, there's no Zion at the top, there's none of that. That's the year the Hawks move up and get the number one <laughs> overall pick. Uh, what are your thoughts, Keith? Atlanta making the surprise jump all the way up, up nine spots to land number one. Yeah, you know, the draft lottery, when they're revealing it, it goes in reverse order. So it goes 14 mm -hmm. down to one. And we obviously, we see the first few come out most years, chalk, right? It was yeah. uh, Portland via Golden State, Sacramento, OKC via Houston, Chicago. Then it was the Utah Jazz. And it was like, well, wait a minute. Yeah, then it was you know, it was like, wait, and that's the jazz move twice. So that meant immediately and how I track it is I have a, obviously it's me. I have a spreadsheet. <laughs> so I am going through and just sliding teams over them. Like, well, wait, that means both Atlanta and Brooklyn via Houston jumped up in this oh. thing. And then they go all the way down to fourth. Um, they pause after they show the fifth pick, the fifth pick, of course, the Detroit Pistons again, Second year in a row, worst possible outcome for them. They slide four picks, four teams jump them. They slide back four slots in the draft down to the fifth pick. Just brutal for, for them. And then we get San Antonio popped up a spot. Brooklyn jumped up six spots. Washington held their place. And then Atlanta jumps up nine spots in the draft order to, to be the number one pick. Just incredible. And now, Immediately where I go to is, all right, this, this isn't winning the Wembenyama draft. No. So immediately I start thinking, all right, what does this do for cap space? Toronto had slid back a couple spots. They only needed to slide one. Their pick now goes to San Antonio. All right, San Antonio is going to have two picks when they only maybe thought they'd have one. And I start refiguring out the cap space. Detroit cuts about 12-ish million, or not 12 million, I'm sorry, about 6-ish million. Detroit. Uh, their, their books. So now they've got 6 million more in cap space. Their fans are super thrilled with it because they're like, great, we can sign Tobias Harris and trade for some other uh, 12 centers on bad contracts. So it's just, that's a mess for them. But yeah, th this is going to be really, really fun to get 
watch play out the rest of the way. What I'm also super excited about with all of this is now we are, are like you referenced when we started the show, we are full on into teams are talking about trading the pick. Other trades related to where the teams fell in this draft, this has a chance to be awesome because of that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Let me let me ask you this. I heard this this morning uh, about Atlanta. And Atlanta's going to obviously push back strongly against this, but the notion that there's more danger because of this draft, there's no clear number one guy, that increases the likelihood that you're going to miss. And we know what missing on a draft pick. We know how fans don't let that kind of stuff go. We know the way that that goes. If you're Atlanta, how do you handle this? Because the probability, given that there is no clear standout guy, the probability that the player you pick at number one is not the best player in the draft is higher than it typically would be. How do you manage that if you're the Hawks? Yeah, that's tough. That's a really good point. I think you trust your process with your scouting and you go in and say, hey, we're we're going to get in there. We're going to pick it. I don't don't think they'll move it. I think it was Bill Simmons who said on his show last night that posted probably last night. I listened to it this morning. Uh, only three times in history has the number one pick ever been traded. So mm. as much as that gets bandied around of teams are listening and blah, blah, blah. It just sure. never happens, right? That's three times and I don't know, what, what have we had, 70 like some odd drafts or something? Yeah. So we're in a spot with this where they're going to keep the pick and you just have to really trust your scouting, trust your guys, and pick the guy you think will be the best player uh, because they are not so locked in at any position where it is like, just don't draft X, right? Don't right. don't draft the center. Don't draft a point guard. And point guard, people are probably like, what do you mean? They had they have two point guards. Well, we're gonna talk about that in a couple minutes here. Yep. Maybe they don't. Um, but you if you feel like the best guy is Alex Sar, who that's the number one guy on my personal board. I think he's the number one guy on a lot of people's draft yep. boards. You 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 pick him. If you think it's Zachary Risache, the forward out of France. You you go you go take him if you think that's best who player it is. If you, yeah, you, you just take whoever the best guy is, and and then you hope for the best. What's more challenging for the Hawks, and I think any of that, by moving from ten to um from from ten to one, they went from let me let me pull it up just so I have the number correctly. They added, let's see, the tenth tenth uh, pick was about five point five million is the first uh -huh. round rookie scale uh, money. Atlanta is now going to pay that player $12.6 million. So $7 million added on to their, to their books. That's going to have the Hawks in a position where they're dancing right around that luxury tax line. Now. Uh -huh. Like they, they are right there pending what happens with a couple of resignings, a couple other guys. So if you just took the guaranteed money on their books, they have 10 guaranteed salaries and you took uh, the, the first round pick. They're already at $171 million. And that's against a luxury tax line of actually they'd be just over about 600,000 over. Uh, or I'm sorry. I take that back. They're about 400,000 under uh, the, the luxury tax right now. Um, and that's not with a full roster. You still have four roster spots to fill there. So they, they, they've got some work to do for sure. So when we talk, and let's just, we'll get back to the draft in just a moment, but while we're on Atlanta, um, we, we've got the story, Victor Wembanyama is interested in playing with, with Trey Young. With what you're saying about the cap situation right now, that to me says that one of the goals in a, if it's Trey Young, DeJounte Murray, whatever it is they're trading, one of the goals of Atlanta might be to shed a little bit of salary to not be the team that's taking back more salary in a trade. So maybe that informs us a little. Now, again, there's other things they can do, but maybe that informs us as we're building out our fake Trey Young trade packages that the Hawks, it would behoove them to not take back any additional salary if they want to try to duck that tax. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're in a spot where you definitely want to do that. You you want to try to rebalance your books a little bit this summer, whether it's Trey Young trade. I did now Woj's reported you know, they're, they're expected to listen and look at Trey Young trades. They're still going to listen on DeJounte Murray. Mm -hmm. I, I think everybody has landed where if we look up and it's like July 10th or whatever, 
in those guys are both still on Atlanta's roster. Like, wow, what happened? Right. Like that, that seems like that's going to get done. And one of those two guys will be gone. Brian Windhorse reported uh, today that it seems more likely that they'll move Trey Young than DeJounte Murray, which makes some sense because mm-hmm. why not go get a, go get a, pretty good haul back for him. I don't think it'll be a Donovan Mitchell like haul where it's no. a bunch of picks and draft pick swaps and all those things. I think teams are going to be a little more cautious, but I think it'll still be pretty good. You're, you're still going to get two or three firsts and in, in uh talent back in a trade like that. But to your point on the books, you have a chance here to get rid of 40 plus million in salary. You'd like to do that in a trade where you take back maybe like 25 or maybe yeah. 30 and really get yourself room. On. <laughs> I love it. Stu's showing up. Studio Stu. He loves trade talk. He um, does. I, I know that. Yeah. Trade talk it's, and tuna, right? That, that's it. That's all you need. Trade talk. Yeah. hundred percent trade talk, <laughs> tuna and, uh, and wreaking havoc. Those are his, uh, his pastimes. <laughs> so we, um, so yeah. So with uh Trey though, you take back a little less money, get yourself under the tax, really reset because it's not like you're going to be talentless, right? You still have a team that can compete. Mm -hmm. I think in the Eastern conference for a playoff spot And that's a bet. You can be in a spot where it's, Hey, we're trying to get into the playoffs. If you are a team that is underneath the tax line, if you're over the tax line, you have to be a playoff team. And they're just not there right now as presently constructed. So um, just in case people are wondering too, like, how did they get here? Why are they so expensive? And I had somebody ask me just yesterday, they traded John Collins. Like, how, how are they still so expensive? And one of the things I told them was they traded John Collins, but any of the flexibility that they freed up going into this coming season and beyond, they ate up by extending Anyeka Kong and DeJounte Murray. The Hawks do not have a bad contract on their cap sheet. There is nowhere, and I see you're pulling it up, so this is perfect. Mm-hmm. None of these contracts are bad. Even Trey Young is not bad. Trey Young's a star guy. So none of these contracts are bad. The problem is there's just too many of them, right? Yeah. You, you have your top, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six guys all making at least $14 million for next season. It's just too much. You, you just can't be in that position if you're going to be a 500 team. If you're a Boston or the Clippers or one mm-hmm. of the the Timberwolves, the Nuggets, your your playoff team, you're you're very very expensive. You're deep into the tax. That's different. That's a different story. You're at a different level. or hoping to be there. If you're the Hawks, you can't have four guys north of twenty million with two others making fourteen and seventeen. It's just too too many contracts. And look in the about midway down the page there, Jalen Johnson's going into his last year mm-hmm. under contract and extension they want to keep eligible him. this summer. Yeah, and yeah. he's been really jumped forward in a big way this summer. Mm-hmm. And what's not showing there, because it's not on the roster yet, the $12.6 million for the number one overall pick. So it, it's just, it's it's too much. So something has to give this summer for Atlanta. Well, the good thing, if Victor Wembanyama is interested indeed in playing with Trey Young, is that the Spurs would have some cap room to absorb salary. Yeah. You don't have to send back matching salary. So that would be an incentive to the Atlanta Hawks to get something like that done with, with that team. Um, yeah. I don't, it doesn't, whether it's Trey or not, the Spurs need to find a point guard, probably multiple point guards this year. Uh, there was a rumor going around that they might even consider bringing in a veteran point guard just to teach a younger point guard they could get. Um, so that, and that's maybe something to consider when we look at the draft and we look at who might be available, but they need very clearly, we've watched this team play at all. First of all, aside from Wemby, I'm sorry. Um, but if you watch this team play, it was very difficult to to stomach their problems at the point guard. But you could just see the team was screaming for a ball handler and somebody that could make an entry pass into the post, somebody that could give the ball to Wemby. I think whether it's Trey Young or not, they're going to go get somebody. But I do think Trey makes a lot of sense. I almost wonder, though, if San Antonio might say, we'd rather have our guy DeJounte back. Let's talk about him. They could, or they might say, uh, we kind of like your draft picks. Like we'd rather yeah. have those, right? Because that's the, if I'm Atlanta, if I'm trading you either one, uh, let's talk about getting my picks back. We'll we'll avoid the draft day uh, comp there and all of them and pancakes and David Blackie. <laughs> but it's uh, you know, that's where I would start any conversation. Is I could have some of your draft pick. I could have some of my draft picks back. Yeah, from all you. of them. I love the Trey Young 
fit in San Antonio. Like, uh -huh. like so much. I think Wambanyama can more than cover for some of his deficiencies. You put you put Trey Young on that team with Devin Vassell, Keldon Johnson, Jeremy Sohan, Victor Wambanyama. That's your let's say that's your starting five going into next year. Round that out with a couple bench pieces. Mm -hmm. I Off think that's a team that's pulls a rockets and you're right there in playoff contention. Maybe you don't make it, but you're competing for the play in tournament, maybe even beyond. And I think then two years in you're a playoff team. Like that's how good that team can be. That I am also that, that absolutely high on one Binyama that I think mm -hmm. we are maybe not next year, but by year three for him, he's getting MVP votes. Like I think that's where he's going to be is in the conversation. And I think Trey young, man, he, just imagine Trey Young running that offense, like throwing lobs to Wemby, you know, be, being the kickout guy to space the floor. Mm -hmm. Like, like there's just a lot of really good stuff that he could do for them with enough guys to cover for him defensively. I, I think you can absolutely make that work. I mean, Pop won titles with Tony Parker, who was at best a competitive defender. Like never, I think, was anybody a sure. good defender. And they won titles with good defenses with him. Uh, leading the way, I think you could absolutely do that with Trey Young. So, I that that it's almost so feels like it's too obvious of a match, right? Like yeah. it feels like that's the one. You know, I, I know when uh, various trade machines are up and running, that's probably going to be the number one thing that people are going to be plugging in. But to your point, Spurs, I project them have about twenty one million in cap space this summer. They can absolutely get uh, get get in there. Uh, far easier to make a trade, yeah, because they, they've got a couple interesting guys they could throw back to Atlanta too if they really wanted to. Well, and so you've got the four, and the, let's jump to San Antonio. You've got the fourth pick and the eighth pick via Toronto. Toronto fans, very split. Some saying, get yeah. this done, convey the pick now so we don't have to worry about it in the future when the draft is better. Uh, others saying, we really want to keep the pick. They did not get to keep the pick. They dropped two spots. They give the eighth pick to the Spurs. But now the Spurs have four and eight in this year's draft. Now, there's some interesting players that are going to be available there, but I do wonder if there's if the Spurs go for a big move here. You could combine those two and you package both those picks, plus you've got caps. Now, maybe you just use one of them. We'll see. But I could very easily see the Spurs being a team to move one or both of those picks in order to make a move to land somebody for Wemby right now. Yeah, I could see that. I, I I don't know. I think the challenge is going to be finding trade partners who want to do that. Now, maybe they, that could be yeah. part of the package to get Trey Young. Obviously, right? You could send one or both of those picks for Trey Young sure. if you were going to make a trade like that. So that's certainly possible. But I I also won't be surprised if they just stick and make two picks and say, hey, we added two more young players that we think mm -hmm. can be really good fits to your point, draft a point guard with one of them, bring in a veteran guy to kind of shepherd that point guard along. And then you, you move forward where your plan is. Yeah. Maybe in a couple of years, that guy's ready to take over as a starter. Uh, I know a lot of people have said, couldn't they get Chris Paul if he's waived? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if Chris Paul wants to kind of finish it out that way. I think it's more likely he would rather be on a contender probably one on the West coast. If we're being honest, just all things uh, being equal, but maybe, maybe he would say, yeah, playing a play, chance to play for pop. I'm going to play with one Binyama. Like we, we can get here. You know, I, I can do something pretty good here. Maybe. Um, but somebody like that. Sure. There, there are guys like that. You could go get um, that could do that. Tyus Jones, whose brother is already there. Bring him in. He'd be a good caretaker point sure. guard for a couple of years. And if you don't use your cap space in a big move, you could use that as a, like you overpay a guy for a couple of years. Maybe you pay Tyus Jones 15 million a year for a couple of seasons just to get him. And then you figure it out. But yeah, I, they, uh, ESPN's post lottery mock has him getting Rob Dillingham, the point guard out of Kentucky. And then Dalton connect. Who's the like wing shooter out of Tennessee. That'd be a home run draft for me for San Antonio. Mm -hmm. um, if they want to get those two guys, then you use your cap space to go, go, go get a vet or two to fill things out and go. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, I, I would be beyond excited if I was a Spurs fan. If I'm a Raptors fan, I'm not that upset that I conveyed the pick. It's over. Now it's done. We can just move forward. Toronto now owns all of their own future first. They have an additional Indiana first coming their way. It's got 
I think top four protections on it for a couple years. So that'll come their way from the Siakam trade. They're pretty well set up with second round picks too. It's just over. It's done. They do have a first round pick later in the round. It's like 19th or something. So that's good uh, mm-hmm. for um, for Toronto. So you still get a pick in the draft. I, I This draft is not so strong that I'm like, oh man, we're missing out on player X, right. Y, and Z. Maybe it does. History tells us it turns out that way in San Antonio drafts a Hall of Famer at that spot. But for now, I'd be pretty content with being out of this, uh, top of this and being out of that obligation and just free and clear moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, agreed there. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of mock drafts that have Nikola Topic going to uh, yeah. San Antonio. That feels like such a Spursy pick too. So yeah. that would that would you make some get sense. Point guard, right? Get, get the yes, young point exactly. guard and let uh, let somebody um you know uh, mentor him. I guess is the best way to put that. All right, let's talk a little bit about Houston. That's one of our our news topics of the day. The Rockets as well as the Grizzlies potentially shopping their pick. Houston's got that number three pick. Um, uh, Houston's a team that is. They were flirting with the play-in this year. There were moments where it looked like they were going to make that run. I know they would like to make that leap next year. They've got a pretty solid amount of young talent on this roster already. They're another team where when you talk about how many teams are going to be willing to potentially move out of the first round of this year's draft, they're another team that I think we should keep our eyes on. I don't know what a third overall pick is going to net you in this year because again the general perception is that this is not a super strong draft class but i could see the rockets making a move to go get somebody to try to put them over the top uh i don't know if that means a true veteran like into their 30s probably not but if they can go add a piece uh and not use that third pick on a player instead use it in a trade i think i think atlanta and washington keep their picks I think the fir- the where the spot that the trade talks really start at it's number three with Houston and wouldn't shock me at all if they move it. Yeah, same um, with you on that. I think the Rockets are they're trying to win now, not not necessarily going all in. They're not like, hey, we're going to trade Jamari Smith Jr. and and Alperin Shingun and the pick for you know this minor upgrade. Like they're not they're not that deep in, but they're trying to win. They're, they're trying to get themselves into the playing tournament at least, or if not beyond. Uh, next season so yeah so i'm with you on that one i think i think there's a decent chance that this pick gets moved I, you know me with trades i'm always going to say it's 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 less likely that one happens than will happen because that's just what the math says but i i think that if everybody says the draft really starts at okay i think the draft starts at one because the mm-hmm. draft is so flat in terms of talent but i think the the trade talks i'm with you start with houston at three and that that could be a place where things get really really interesting just because of, of where they're at as a team yeah absolutely and then memphis being another team that's shop, shopping their pick of course you know and remember shopping doesn't mean teams definitely trading uh, realistically keith everybody should be shopping their pick to yeah. some degree i mean Hey, what do you what do you give me? Will you will you give me? I mean, Atlanta should be calling around. Hey, will you give me something stupid for for number one? Cool, right? Like everybody yeah. should be listening, of course, to trade offers. But I think Memphis is another team that's particularly going to be motivated. This is a team that, despite finishing low uh, in the Western Conference, that was due to injuries, that was due to suspension. They didn't have a team. I mean, that was. Keith, I, I went to that game. I was at that game in the the press conference with um, with Taylor Jenkins ahead of the game when the injury report for the Grizzlies get released, and there were seventeen names on yeah. it. Like that, they, they didn't have a team, so they I think are going to jump right back into the mix in the Western Conference. And I'm looking at that ninth pick as being a piece they could certainly move in order to help facilitate their standing in the West. Not only were you at that game, that was a game I think the Lakers were losing at halftime, yep. maybe, or it was at least very close. And I sent you a text, and I'll clean it up for the uh, for for the family <laughs> viewers and listeners here. And it basically said, "WTF, dude? Like, like, what is happening? Like, this was, it was that's so bad." Was so, but in the Lakers, I I'm certain they came back to win that game. In the they did. Half. Yeah, they but did. it was J- yeah, Jake I mean, Larabia went nuts. A number of other guys went nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so Memphis, I, I, sure, I can see why they would trade the pick. The Grizzlies are wildly expensive right now. They, if they uh, pick up Luke Kennard's team option, which is 
a lot. Normally, you just you pick that up and you move on. But if they pick that up, they're at a hundred and seventy six million dollars for that. Now, the good news is that's fourteen players up on their roster, so they only have one open roster spot to go with. The challenge for Memphis is that puts them into the tax. Now, being in the tax now or at the start of the summer, yeah. the start of the season, not a big deal. You have all the way until the trade deadline to get out of it. It'd only be about five, six million dollars into the into the tax. That's a uh, let's see, that's a Zaire Williams salary dump trade sure. away from getting out of the tax entirely, or John Conchar or whoever. The challenge is you still have to do that, right? And sometimes ownership groups get a little a little wonky on. I don't know. I'm still seeing that we're in the tax. I'm still seeing we're in the tax. And they may be looking at and saying, is Luke Kennard going to play more than 50 games? Mm -hmm. Like, what's he going to do? We we have a bunch of guards. And, you know, yeah, those guards all got hurt last year. But, you know, what's that going to look like? It's that That's where things could get a little weird with, with that one. So I think we're in a spot, though, for Memphis where they could go either way. Yuta Watanabe. I, it, he's already sounds like he's committed to playing in Japan next year. Mm -hmm. um, that 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 rumor came out probably close to a month or so ago now um, that he's going to leave the NBA. So that he'll come off the books, presumably one way or the other. Um, what would be smart on his side is pick up the option and then try to force them to waive you. But they may say no and just bring you back. So that he may just say, I'm out. I'm go back to Japan. I decline mm -hmm. my player option. But all that aside, it, it, it's tough because there is a world where you say, hey, five million bucks for a rookie scale guy. Wouldn't really hate having that guy come into the roster because Williams, Aldama, Conchar, those guys maybe have a little less certainty with their futures on this roster moving forward. So it, it, that's truly more of a 50-50 one for me, whether they'll move that pick or not. And now they, if they don't, let's say they keep that pick and talk about, say, five million bucks for it. Plus, you're already sitting at 176 million. So that's going to put you above that first that tier. Factors, apron. The, that factors in the, the picks factored in at 176. Oh, that's already in there. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're still close. So, in that case, in terms of spending, but let's say nothing changes, they don't make a trade, you keep the pick. Um, in that case, you're we're probably talking if they want to do any kind of spending in free agency, we're looking at a, at a taxpayer MLE versus yep. a full MLE at this point. Yeah, without which, a doubt. Which maybe gives you some incentive to drop a little bit of salary to see if you can get access to it. But I, again, they already have a pretty full roster, as you said. So, yeah. But I do think this this is a team that's screaming to me for consolidation. So, I, I think they're going to be motivated to make something happen here. Exactly where that leaves them cap wise, I don't know. But I, I think the number nine pick will very much be in play if they can find the right deal. I think clearly we'll know before the draft happens, before Kennard's option is due, if I am uh, right on when his option is due. Um, oh, yeah. But the, so we'll know where they're maybe leaning. If they keep that pick, then maybe they're leaning towards declining Kennard's option and letting him go into free agency and letting it go that way. If they do decline Kennard's option, now they're in range of being able to use the non-taxpayer. It would hard cap them, but it hard caps them at the first apron. So no real big deal there. So I think we're in a spot where a lot, lot of options for the Grizzlies on how they want to do that. And, and opening up the full non-taxpayer, not the worst thing this year. I think sure. while this free agent class is missing out on the true top end talent, it is actually fairly deep in, um, uh, rotation level guys, guys who can come in, play real rotation minutes. I think we actually have quite a few players like that. And those are the guys you can use the non-taxpayer to get. And maybe even a couple of them now. They're going to run into roster spot challenges with that, yeah. but th that's fine. You figure that out. All right, let's jump over to the Pelicans. Brandon Ingram, buzz growing that he could be on the market for the Pels. Kate, this makes a lot of sense to me for them to move on. You know, They've tried this. They've tried Brandon Ingram being their number two guy uh, behind Zion. He's not available enough. He played in 64 games this year. That's the most games he's appeared in since his rookie season. Now think about that. That's the most games Brandon Ingram, who's now turning 27, it's the most games he's played in since he was a rookie coming in at the younger end of the rookie class. He was like 18, 19 years old when he came in. And now he's appeared in 64 games and that still isn't enough to qualify for any awards. So just to kind of put that into perspective, 
He played 79 games as a rookie, has played less than 64 every season since then. The Pelicans need somebody that's available. And I think Brandon Ingram at this point, he might be at, at his best where he's ideally being used as a number three guy and a, not, a, not a number two guy. So to me, it makes sense that the Pelicans are looking to potentially move on here. I'm with you on this one. Uh, this is uh, both Mark Stein and Mike Scotto have both reported this um, now that this could be where, where they look to go. Another challenge for Brandon Ingram is he's due for an extension or if no extension mm -hmm. comes, a new contract next summer. So the summer of 2025. I don't know that I want to give him a max deal and I'm sure that's right. where he's going to start the conversation. If I'm the Pelicans, I, I really don't feel good about that at all. Uh, go, go in there because I'm with you. I think if you had an awesome number one, meaning top 10 to 15 guy, Brendan Ingram could probably be a pretty good number two. But considering most number ones on teams are in the range of 15 to like 35 or 40, uh, just the way things stack up. And some of the, you know, some teams have two, three number ones on their roster. Um, yeah, Ingram's probably then best is. Not, I'm not going to say just another guy, but like, no, he's your, your low end number two or a high end number three on your team. The other thing that's working against him a little bit, maybe working to the Pelicans' favor, but I don't really pretend to know what he wants to do there, but they've got other guys that play his positions. He's really yeah. a, I think at this point, he's kind of more of a combo forward. I think the shine of him playing the two has kind of gone away a little bit. I suppose you can do it. So if you want to say he's a big wing, which is really probably what he functionally is. Well, they have Herb Jones, Trey Murphy, who can do that. Yeah. Dyson Daniels is a big point guard, so you can even play him off the ball. And then they've got Najee Marshall as a free agent this summer. So the Pelicans have guys who can play the spots where he plays. And I think for New Orleans, it's probably somewhat of a priority, considering he's also rookie-scale extension over the summer, carving out a defined starting spot for Trey Murphy. Because yep. you 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 got to kind of figure out, all right, we can't go into another year with Trey Murphy's our six man and he'll start when other guys are out of the lineup. So, yeah, I would say Brendan Ingram's days might be numbered in New Orleans. So the rumor that's already popping up because people are, you know, connecting the dots here is sure. Brandon Ingram to, At to Atlanta in a Trey Young trade. Now, I don't know if At Atlanta's interest in Brandon Ingram or if they'd want to be a third team involved. But, I mean, those are two names that are out there salary matching wouldn't be super difficult to do sure um and, and if you are the pelicans just like we can talk about the spurs and, and the appeal of trey and and Wemby, trey and zion in theory could work pretty well now you do have that problem of cj mccollum sitting there we've seen cj mccollum play off ball we know how that went in portland they didn't really go anywhere with that but he does have just two years left on his deal at this point. So and maybe they could find another trade for CJ or something like that. It wouldn't be the easiest thing to do, but in any event, a, a branded Ingram trade, I'm sure they're going to, if they're going to move him, they're going to talk to the Hawks about Trey. They're going to call the Cavs about Donovan Mitchell. He's going to be in a lot of those type of, of conversations. Cause I think the Pelicans, they will try to upgrade using Brandon Ingram rather than split him into say multiple pieces. So I saw a really interesting, this is now, Nate, you know how hesitant I am to even go into the fake trade world. But yes. this one, so when one catches me, I, I it's a little more, like, eh, all right. And I really don't like doing it when it turns into, all right, let's do multi-team trades and let's really get crazy. Right. But here were the base parameters of what this was. It was Brandon Ingram goes to the Hawks, Trey Young goes mm -hmm. to, uh, to New Orleans. CJ McCollum lands with the magic because the assumption was the magic uh -huh. don't go anywhere else. And Wendell Carter Jr. lands with New Orleans. Um, so Wendell New Orleans would come away with Wendell Carter Jr. and Trey Young. Uh, so they replaced Jonas Valanciunas and CJ McCollum with Trey Young. They'd move Murphy to the starting group. So it's presumably you'd have Carter, Williamson, Murphy, uh, Jones, and McCollum as your starting mm -hmm. group. Not too bad or not McCollum. I'm sorry. Trey young. Trey young. Yeah, group. Yeah. And then McCollum goes to Orlando. And the, the idea was this is if Orlando doesn't go down other paths with cap space and stuff. The one question I said is would Orlando just cut them out and just take Trey young for themselves. Right. And just say, Hey, we've got the defense around that can support that. That one's a little odd. Cause I don't know that 
Trey Young is a super great fit in Orlando simply because of the touches he would take away from Bancaro and Wagner, where McCollum throughout his career has been better playing off of other guys than being a primary guy himself. So, but yeah, it was, it was interesting enough where I was like, all right, it, it, I, I didn't just reject it out of hand, which is what I generally do with 99.9% .9 of fake trades. Obviously there'd have to be something else in there because inherently that's saying that Brandon Ingram is more valuable than Trey young. If you're getting both Trey and yeah, there was a, yeah, I, I think it was like picks and filler and stuff. Okay. So right. Yeah. It, it wasn't just, Ingram for that's young, just the, straight up. The, yeah. the bones of it. Those okay. were the, yeah, that was like, these are the base parameters. Like, you know, it would probably be like, you want Jordan Hawkins, you want Tyson Daniels, you want, right. you know, a draft pick, you, you know, you want the, the 2025 Lakers pick. Do you want another pick this year? Like we could do that too. Like if you really wanted to accelerate those talks here in the next two weeks, like, yeah, those are all options. So. Okay, let's uh, – well, Brandon Ingram, certainly another name. So Trey Young, Brandon Ingram, maybe Donovan Mitchell. We'll see one of the uh, – some of the top names to watch on the trade market right now. And, of course, Keith, you noticed the other, the other, the other day that if – it's this time of year, now that the draft picks are known, where trade talks will really start to pick up. Now that yep. people really know, hey, this is what we're actually talking about. Teams talking to Atlanta yesterday – didn't know yesterday morning – they didn't really know. Hey, we'll give you we'll give you something for your first. Well, who knows what that first is? Now they know. And now teams can get in with some certainty. And, and I think those talks are going to pick up. I think we're going to have a pretty active trade season here in the NBA as we get closer to the draft. It could be a pretty explosive draft night, too, which is exciting. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me correct myself. Draft nights. Nights, yeah. Draft nights this year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. And that's, that's going to be a fun process just to watch play out, too. How does that change? Yeah what the second round is one last note related to this draft uh, in the lottery and the Hawks coming up at number one. I have seen a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people suggest take your number one pick trade, Trey young really bottom this thing out and tank right. and then try to get another high pick next year. doesn't work. They don't have their pick. Their picks going to the Spurs. So they can't tank. You, you, you can't just bottom right. it out and tank. You, right. you can hit a point where, like the Nets did post Celtics trade where it doesn't matter. Like we're terrible. Anyway, the picks are, are, you know, they're, they're gone. That's the sunk cost. We have to do what's right for us to do everything. Yeah. If Atlanta, if you're not there now, it's different. Obviously if it is, we traded Trey young or DeJounte Murray and we got our picks back. Sure. Then you could say, all right, let's really kind of maybe bottom this thing out and get Cooper flag or get ACE Bailey next year and add them to Alex Sar or whoever and go forward with, you know, our new young front court and figure it out. But for now, that's that's not something the Hawks can really be setting up to do. All right, let's jump over to the playoffs. I figured we should talk about some actual basketball at some point. The thing's happening. Yeah, I mean, it's on still happening. We do. We've got other things to get into. We've got a few things that may wind up getting bumped to tomorrow's show. It's been, yeah. It was a busy weekend. Busy. But, yeah. uh, Keith, oh, my God, the, the, the end of the first half, of Nuggets Wolves was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. Um, a 5-0 run in like five seconds uh, for the for the Nuggets. And it was a total of an 8-0 run. And then the Wolves lost by eight. So this is exactly what we said. You know, don't count Denver out. They could go to Minnesota and win too. They did just that. Keith, is it is it first team to actually win a home game, wins the series? It could be, and that could be as soon as uh, Tuesday. Uh, yeah. tomorrow could, could be as soon as the nuggets winning tomorrow night. I mean, I'm not going to rule that out entirely because that could be how this goes down. I mean, they, they are, they, I'm not going to say they've solved the uh, Timberwolves defense because they're still being challenged, but a couple things. One, it is hard to play with the level of intensity. Minnesota was playing with every single game when you're playing every other sure. day. It's just that that that's hard to ask for a team to do. And I think they were maybe counting on, all right, we're going to get the lift from the home crowd. We're going to get the uh, the bounce from that. We're going to maybe Denver is a little off their game. And if we just get one of these two, we're fine. Even if we go back to Denver and lose and it's 3-2, we're coming back home. We'll close in six. Now this game five, we know winner game five in a 2-2 series, almost it, well, it's like 70 nine eighty percent sure goes on to I mean, win you get two series. shots at it 
to close exactly. it out. Exactly. So, yeah. so that's the the challenge right now that we're looking at in this series. And if I'm Minnesota, if I lose that game game five, I'm starting to think about man missed opportunities. Like we yep. we we really had a chance here, and you had the chance down. And and I say it all the time with Denver, you have to beat them. You have like when you get them down, it's like. You you got you you got to you know oh, cut the head off the yeah. snake and call it done and and move forward and it's finished and now they're done and you just didn't do it you you gave them life and here we are three game series and they've got they've got home court advantage. You leave Denver an opening. You make mistakes. They will take advantage almost yep. every time. Almost every time they will take advantage again. They like the the Wolves. They lost focus at the end of the half. They gave up an eight zero run. They lost by eight. Like that's that that's it right. Um, on top of that, the the Nuggets are very difficult to beat when you've got 40-plus points coming in from Aaron Gordon, Christian Braun, Justin Holiday. When those guys are combining for 40-plus yep. points, they're going to be really tough to beat. Those guys had it going, and credit to them. That's been part of Denver's secret sauce is they've had all their guys have a game where they step up and they make big plays and they hit big shots, and, and we saw that again. So this series, who knows where it's going to go from here? But Game 5 is going to be absolutely massive. Uh, staying in the West tonight, we get Mavs Thunder. Uh, the Mavs right now with the 2-1 lead. This is in Dallas. Series on the line, I think, potentially for the Thunder here. Um, the If the Mavs are able to get this one, that's going to be really tough for OKC to come back from. Yeah, agreed. Uh, OKC needs to have a very short leash for Josh Giddy. And just yes. guys who aren't giving them anything. You can't just keep keep rolling your guys out there. If they're not giving you anything, you got to move to other options. And they 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 haven't really cut the rotation down yet, not fully. And that's probably where we're at for them is cut that rotation down, cut it down to your six, seven guys you really trust, go get this win. And then maybe when you're back home, you can put a couple of those guys back in and hope that they get the bump from the home crowd and off you go. But for right now, you, you you probably need to just like cut cut the rotation down, move forward with 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 less guys. And on the Dallas side, it's a little bit of just kind of keep doing what you've been doing. But who steps up when PJ Washington eventually is no longer molten hot, right? Like right. someone he this is not going to this is not yeah this is not who PJ Washington is like as a player. So this will come 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 back to earth at some point. You hope it doesn't go all the way back to like, well, law of averages says now he needs to go one for 15 and have three points in the game. Like, but it's going to come back crashing down and then probably falls to Luca and Kyrie, but they've also gotten Tim Hardaway juniors, giving them a couple yep. nice games. Now their bigs are doing a nice job. Just, just doing their thing in there. So in Kyrie, he has been incredible these last two games. So the thunder of heaven thing, when we talked about this series before, I was less concerned, as weird as it sounded, but who would cover Luca? I was far more concerned who covers Kyrie. And that's where you you may need to go to Case and Wallace and just say, We need yeah. you, man. Like you're you're gonna have to do it. Cause I, they just don't really have a great option otherwise. There's moments late in the game where Kyrie just does something and he gets you a bucket that I mean, I'm trying like how many other players in the NBA could get you? Like very few. Other players, I don't want to disrespect anybody and say nobody could do it, but he gets you buckets that you just think there was no way anybody else was scoring on that possession. It was crazy. Yeah. Um, he, he is absolutely amazing. And this, you know, the Thunder have been shouting to at everybody who will listen, we're not too young. But we're going to find out. Has, yeah. Does doubt start to creep in? Do they start going, well, maybe it's next year. I don't think so. I think they're going to fire back. But if the Mavs come out early in game four and they punch the Thunder, I want to see how Thunder, how OKC responds. What, what does that look like? Because, again, they've been telling everybody who will listen, they're not too young. Everybody else has been saying, eh, it usually takes a year or two of you know feeling some pain in the postseason before you kind of make that leap. I wonder if that thought is going to start creeping in with them. And that's, that is a subplot. I'm going to be keeping an eye on in game four. Yep. Completely agree. Uh, Celtics Cavs. The key is just a playing out like last round where yeah, the Celtics drop one game. Everybody worries for a moment, but in the end it doesn't really matter. Oh my God. I just went Lincoln park on everybody. 
<laughs> nice. Well done. Um, yeah, I, I think so. Like, hey, we, we did the show on, what was it Friday? Right. And I was just like, yeah, I'm not too concerned. Like, and, and some people were like, how can you not be? And I was like, cause we just saw this happen. Like there, mm-hmm. I, I continue to say Boston will shoot poorly once every five to eight games. If that happens twice in a series, all right, it's going to be a real series. If it only happens once, they're probably going to probably going to move through the vast majority of these teams. We'll see if if and when they get to the finals, that may not be be enough. But sure. for now, it is it, when when they shoot poorly, the defense gets impacted and it just goes sideways. When they look bad, they just look bad, and it looks like oh my gosh, there are all kinds of problems. But then you forget. Oh, they just drilled this team and then they drilled them again and then they drilled them again. It's like, oh yeah, because they are very good and they're 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 that good. And also, Donovan Mitchell now popped up after the game, was not moving well for a lot of the second half, popped up with a strained left calf. Um, mm. reports were he was not at shoot around today, at least the public portion of shoot around. So we don't really know what his status is. Sounds like Jared Allen still isn't gonna be back. Um, sounds like he's still struggling to do what he needs to do with the bruised ribs. So Cavs, I think this is part of why, if you are Boston, get this series over as quick as you can, because the Cavs had to play seven games, the only seven game series in the first round. And they look, mm-hmm. now they look like they're pretty beat up and it looks like they're starting to run out of gas a little bit, run out of steam here. So if you're the Celtics, try to get, get this one tonight, get home, close it out in five, let the big fella continue his, his rehab and recovery process put your feet up for everybody else and wait for the conference finals. And then the last series that we've got, and I am in total agreement with everything you said there about Celtics Cavs. Uh, the last series that we've got Pacers Knicks tied it to a piece. Um, the Knicks are about out of players here. Like they're just, I think the accumulation of all the injuries are starting to really catch up with New York, especially not having OG and Anobi. that is really hurting them right now. But I mean, my goodness, they they look they play with so much so much heart. They're a gutsy team, but it just feels like the it's taking its toll. Having such a short rotation, so many guys out hurt, and the Pacers are the kind of team that can fly up and down the floor and take advantage of fatigue and exhaustion. I think that's what we're starting to see with New York. Yeah, I'm in agreement. I was just finding this. This is what it feels like we're at with, with the uh, with the the oh. Knicks at this. Point. Jump. We got no food. We got no jobs. <laughs> Our pets are falling, falling off. Okay, just calm down. That's kind of where it feels like we're at. Like your pets' heads are falling off. Like it's just like I don't know what more to say. Like they what they say over the weekend. OG Ananobi is running in a pool only. Yeah. So he's not close. He's not playing no. the series. Um. Yeah. Jalen Brunson. Now he's like hobbling around. He looks like he's exhausted. Josh Hart actually came out and admitted after game four, like, yeah, I was tired. Like, so I guess the one plus is they got destroyed so badly that they were able to rest their guys down the stretch of that game, but they're going to get right back at it tonight. They're going back home, but I I don't know, man. I just feel like the Knicks are more than anything else running out of players. Like that's Mm -hmm. all it comes down to. They're a better team than the Pacers. I firmly believe that. They're just running out of guys. So if, if they don't, you know, they, they can't figure it out. And the Pacers are not a great team to be run out of guys against mm-hmm. just because of the way they play, the style they play, getting up and down the floor. It's just really tough. Yeah. And so that series, whew, we'll see ultimately the way that goes. But it feels like things are starting to shift the Pacers' way in this one as the Knicks just continue to run out of gas here. Uh, Keith, we've got a few other time but i think some stuff that maybe we should just hit tomorrow hey, we've already good. gone pretty we've we've had a pretty extensive show as it is we've talked quite a bit about playoffs and all that sort of stuff uh all the draft stuff to break down so I want to thank everybody for joining us but make sure that you do subscribe to the youtube channel don't forget to turn on those notifications as well and go check out our Substack, the basketball bulletin uh basketballbulletin.substack.com Right now, doing another mock draft, getting that ready for you guys. Tons of draft content Literally is out there. Right now while we're recording. Like, <laughs> like as we're we're talking through, yeah, we're making picks here. So, so make sure that you guys do uh, do go check that out again. Basketballbulletin.substack.com. Some great draft content that's going up over there. But Keith, this was fun. It was an exhausting weekend, 
And we already have stuff ready for, for tomorrow's show. So it's going to be another busy day tomorrow. Yeah, it absolutely is. And again, Trevor said it. Now's the time to subscribe. We we are full on in our sweet spot. This is this is when we we do the most work we can. And what part of what we promise to you all is you hear trade rumors, you hear this team could sign this guy. We'll come and tell you, can they? Can they not? Right. Like, is that real? What can happen? Because you're gonna see a lot of stuff out there. There's random speculation of yo, know, uh, I, I think the Milwaukee Bucks should sign LeBron James. Right. Okay, how? Like, unless he's taking a minimum, it ain't happening. And we'll, we'll, we'll always tell you guys, you know, the be best we can with all that stuff and get in everything. And it's going to be a lot of fun. This is the, this is the best time of year. Great time to subscribe, get on board and, and tell, tell some friends, right. Help, help them out there too. And, and if you can pop over to Apple um, podcast re review over there, um, you know, if you can actually write a review, it's really helpful. Helps more people find the show that way too. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, everybody till tomorrow. See ya. And stay safe.